Support for the Capital Connection comes from United University Professions, representing 37,000 academic and professional employees at SUNY campuses and teaching hospitals across New York State. Frederick E. Cole, President, UUPinfo.org. And New York State United Teachers, representing professionals in education and healthcare, online at nysut.org. It's the Capital Connection. Hi, I'm Alan Chartok. Joining us this week is Republican New York State Assembly Minority Leader William Will Barclay. Leader Barclay, good to have you back with us. Well, thank you very much for having me on the show. I understand that you're joining us fresh from a press conference on the issue of Raise the Age, where you and members of the Minority Conference announced legislation to reform what you say is flawed legislation and improve the level of accountability for those who commit violent felony crimes. District attorneys also support you, including Albany's Democratic DA, David Soares. So this issue does cross party lines. Yeah, it's a bipartisan issue. Uh, as I said, the same with bail reform, I think, applies to raise the age. Uh, when these uh, laws were enacted, they didn't take in any consideration from law enforcement or from district attorneys. And they they they, qual- they qualified as reform, but they have real world consequences. And as a result, uh, one of the statistics I was mentioned today um, for the Thousands of um, 16 and 17 year olds are arrested for felony charges. Only 8% of those have ever been convicted of uh, felony charges. So it's clearly uh, things are falling through the cracks here and some reform of the reform legislation uh, needs to be uh, had. So let's go into that a little bit. We're talking with Assembly Minority Leader William Barclay. And on the question of bail reform, Governor Kathy Hochul says shootings and murders are down in New York, while the homicide rate in the state is nearly two times lower than the national average. Those were some of the numbers she released as she highlighted her public safety proposal Wednesday in the executive budget. The Democrat also said she has always supported the underlying premise of bail reform despite efforts to alter the law. Hochul says she stands by her plan to remove the so-called least restrictive clause from the bail-eligible cases, something she says contradicts a section of the same bail law. It's also something that is not included in either the state Senate or Assembly budgets. Your thoughts? Well, I hope, first of all, yeah, it, it is welcome news that allegedly some crime is down in New York. I think we all should uh, celebrate that, though I think we have a long ways to go. Our crime rates, particularly shootings, are at historic highs. So there's some areas where crime's down, other areas that they've still got some work to do. As I said, bail reform, raise the age, these things don't take place in a vacuum. They're not some theoretical policy that you know everybody can feel good about passing. They have real-world consequences. And I'm not saying bail reform, raise the age, you know, those alone are, are, are causing the increase in crime, but they're certainly contributing to it. So reform needs to be done. I hope the governor sticks to her guns and will try to get it done through the budget when she has the most uh, – Um, most uh, ability to get something done. I'm a little worried because of her press conference yesterday. It seemed like she was equivocating a little bit on on whether she's going to push those through or not. So I hope she does, and I think the time is right to do it now. Well, Will Barclay, uh, that's very interesting stuff. On bail reform, what is it in bail reform that you think needs our attention? Well, I, we always think we need to go farther than the governor. We think uh, we should have judges have discretion when the, the offender is a danger to the community. As I've mentioned, I think, on this show before, but many other interviews, other states like New Jersey that uh, instituted bail 
reform have that dangerousness uh, ability in in their laws. I don't know why we it seems like common sense and why we can't get that done in New York. We ought to have to trust our judges to be able to make that type of determination. Well, it's interesting. There will be those who think that bail reform is basically either too liberal or too conservative. What do we say about that? Well, I said this at the press conference because I believe it, and I know my conference believes it too. We're not just you know knee-jerk reaction against any kind of changes to the criminal justice system. When there's you know injustices in the criminal justice system, they ought to be addressed. But what the Democrats have done with bail, with raise the age is they've just thrown the whole system out. They, instead of using, I've used this example, instead of using a scalpel to make reforms, they mm-hmm. use a chainsaw. And they didn't, they didn't, you know, uh, talk to the DAs. They didn't get any insight from law enforcement. And as a result, we're suffering through some bad public policy. Could we be a little bit more specific? I'm sorry to press you like this, but what is it in bail reform? What is it in, in these changes that troubles you so much? Well, first, pick raise the age. There is no disclosure for prior crimes and raise the age. So even, uh, say it goes to family court, or if it's a violent felony, it would go to the, uh, it's not, it's a criminal section of family court. But the judges and the prosecutors can't look at a prior record. So what we're doing is some of these, particularly with gun charges, people can be arrested multiple times on gun charges. It's like it'd be the first offense into perpetuity, and they just put them back out on the street. And frankly, Alan, that's not helping anyone. It's certainly not providing safety for the community, but it's also not good for the offender because they're not getting any support. They're just being put back on the street, and usually, you know, they're in not a good environment, whether it's gang-related, family-related, or whatever. And just to put them back in that is not helping them either. So it's not good for the offender. It's not good for the public safety. It's not very good, obviously, for any of the victims of the crime. You sound so reasonable in all of this. Is there anything you do? Is there anything that we need to pay particular attention to here? Well, I think, again, it's having the political will to make these changes and maybe understanding that we went too far initially. I know that's hard for any elected official to admit maybe they made a mistake and just go back, institute what I see as common sense changes to this law, and there's no reason it can't be bipartisan. And I'm happy that there is bipartisan support for some of the changes we're, we're being proposed uh, by you know, di- district attorneys across the state. Earlier this week, you wrote a letter to Governor Hochul and Comptroller DiNapoli about the not-so-smooth rollout of the cannabis program. What did the letter say, and what are your recommendations? Well, we'd like to see the whole program audited. I think the rollout has been a disaster on uh, they still don't haven't licensed. I think they've only licensed two or three operations, or maybe more, four operations. Uh, and they're supposed to have a 150 million dollar fund. Apparently, they don't have any money to do that. And as a result, uh, because we you know lowered the prosecution for marijuana, you see all these black market. Uh, places uh, pop up around really in New York City, but I think they're also throughout the state. And uh, we want to have the whole system essentially audited by the controller, and that's what we're requesting. I was pleased uh, that the governor did apparently address in her press conference uh, that she is going to start cracking down on these illegal black market uh, retail establishments. So we keep hearing about the illegal cannabis shop that are open in New York City. You just mentioned some of this legalization was supposed to end the black market, but the cost to buy legal cannabis is much higher than sticking with an illegal dealer. Should the price be dropped? Well, this is why I've had trouble seeing exactly how this is going to work in New York State, because anytime you have government involved, they want to tax it, rightfully so, uh, and they're going to try to regulate it heavily. That's going to cause the price to increase. So I, I don't know how much the state can drop the price to try to compete with the the black market. I always said on this, we shouldn't be legalizing cannabis. We should look at the prosecution for cannabis crimes, but not actually legalizing and give it the government stamp of approval. And I still feel that way. I'm not overly surprised, unfortunately, that the system is in disarray and we're seeing all these black market retail uh, cannabis establishments. We're speaking to Assembly Minority Leader William Barclay. So let me ask you this. The big news of the week started last Saturday when former President Trump said he was going to be arrested on Tuesday this week. 
Well, that didn't happen, but as we speak, it's very possible this could happen before this, this show airs. But either way, <laughs> what are your thoughts about the possible arrest of a former president? Well, I think that's probably, if you like Trump or hate Trump, uh, obviously people have strong feelings about the guy personally. I don't, from what I can tell, now I'm not an insider on this, but it worries me because it doesn't look like the charges that they're claiming uh, against Trump are, I don't want to say they're not substantial, but they're not, I, it seems flimsy, I guess, in the best way I can uh, look at it. So I think if you're going to prosecute a former president, you better have your ducks in a row and it better be a very strong case. And I'm just worried uh, that this may have, uh, it does certainly smell that there's political motivation on this rather than pursuit of justice. So then, should New York Republicans and the state party distance itself from Trump? I think it's up to the individuals. I, I don't think this is a reason to distance yourself from Trump. I think he's given a lot of reasons to maybe dis distance yourself from him. But uh, again, this prosecution, I'll be curious if it actually ends up going forward. It sounds like there's some real problems with the case. Uh, again, I, I don't know it all that well. So I think people can make their own decision whether they want to distance themselves or not from Trump. Now, what about North Country Republican Congresswoman Elise Stefanik? She's aligned herself with Trump and is now appearing on a short list of potential vice presidential candidates, which I have mentioned in our previous conversation. So isn't this a risk for Stefanik, especially if Trump is indicted? Well, I, let me say this. She's been a terrific North Country Congresswoman. And I know she's been a leader in her uh, caucus or conference in, in Washington. So if she continues doing that, I'd say that's terrific. If she becomes a vice president candidate, I know she'll be a great uh, candidate there. And, you know, whatever her you know, alignment with Trump is, that's her decision to make. So we waited and waited and waited. And then we heard that the New York boss would be the same as the old boss. I'm referring to your new, question mark, party <coughs> chairman of the GOP past Chairman Ed Cox. Why not have somebody actually new run the party? Well, I think Ed right now is the right person in time uh, for the party. Uh, we're in transition. We came off a, a uh, I see it as a very successful election for us, particularly in, in the assembly. Obviously, we weren't able to win the gubernatorial race, but it was closer than I think a lot of people predicted and certainly closer than any of the races we've had in recent history for governor. So I think there's a lot of excitement uh, in the party. And, you know, our conference, we picked up five, five seats. That makes my my uh, members very happy. But so I, and I think, you know, Ed's a steady hand and that, that's what we need right now. And, I, you know, I think he did a good job last time and I think we'll do a good job this time. Speaking of which, I spoke to Ed Cox last week, and he said he'd be relying on former lawmaker John Faso for his advice as a kind of co-chair of the party. What do you make of that? Well, as uh, John, as you know, not only being a former congressman, was also the former minority leader in the Assembly. So I uh, have a great relationship with him. And knowing what it takes or what the work you have to do to put in to be leader of this conference, I know any effort that he puts in and a uh, role he'll play in the party would be very beneficial for the GOP. We're talking to New York State Assembly Minority Leader William Will Barclay. The New York State budget, of course, is due April 1st. That's coming fast. So far, Governor Hochul released her $227 billion state budget. Last week, each house of the legislature released their budget proposals. This week, conference committees began meeting, giving us a sense of what's happening with the budget process. What can you tell us about all of that? Well, let me just talk about her spending plan and then what the legislature is proposing. As you mentioned, the governor is proposing uh, a budget of $227 billion. I would remind you, just five years ago, Alan, the budget was $170 billion. So if we end up passing hers, it will be almost a $60 billion increase over five years. The legislature uh, wants to go even farther. I think the Assembly's budget proposal is something like $30, $231 billion, and the uh, Senate's at like $235 billion. So this this is what worries me. We cannot sustain this type of spending. It's just not a sustainable system. People, it's already hard to live in New York, hard to be affordable in New York. People are leaving the state because they can't afford uh, to live here. And if we keep spending 
the way we've been spending, we're just going to see an increase of people uh, leaving the state because we have to raise taxes. Somehow you got to pay for all these all the spending. Let's talk about guns for a minute. In early March, you and your Assembly Minority Conference joined a lawsuit to challenge the Concealed Carry Improvement Act, CCIA. And what you say is an unconstitutional gun law in New York. You say that the CCIA passed during an extraordinary session of the legislature and signed into law on July 1st, 2022, imposed a wide range of questionable requirements and restrictions on gun permit holders. Tell us more about that. Well, I'm a big proponent of uh, the right to bear arms, and I think we always had some very onerous gun restrictions in New York that I don't think actually uh, had any relationship to trying to curb gun violence. I think it, they ultimately just affect legal gun owners and prevent their ability to bear arms. And so, unfortunately, when the Supreme Court came in and said, well, your uh, concealed carry permitting process is unconstitutional, so instead of New York of you know, following what we, I believe, was what the Supreme Court laid out uh, for appropriate law, uh, we doubled down and made them even more onerous uh, gun control. And uh, so that's what's being challenged in the courts. I'm very optimistic that the laws that New York passed will eventually be overturned by the Supreme Court. Okay, so how do we deal with illegal guns? Well, illegal guns, that's not, that ought to be dealt with. People that are, you know, trafficking or uh, selling and buying illegal guns ought to be prosecuted. But this isn't talking about legal guns. This is, this is trying to curb the ability for people to have legal um uh, you know, legal firearms, and this is curbing the, those people's rights. So again, I don't think the laws that have been instituted in New York State. I don't know many criminals that look to go get their concealed carry permit and you know do the background checks and have to have five people vouch for them. I'm not sure any criminals doing those types of uh, uh, requirements. Well, Will Barclay, do you carry a gun? I don't carry. I do have a pistol permit, and I do own uh, several guns. I'm an outdoorsman, so I like to hunt and fish, so I have some long guns. Uh, And I do have a concealed carry permit, but I don't use it. But you don't carry a revolver? I do not. Okay. So you wrote a column in which you say local roads are essential, that New Yorkers rely on local roads, bridges, and culverts to go to work, go to school, run their errands, and enjoy our state's many great recreational destinations. Unfortunately, you say, these same roads and bridges have been financially neglected for too long, and travelers from all over the state have been forced to navigate the state under less than ideal conditions to that end. Your conference has called for an additional $200 million in the upcoming budget. You also have called for $70 million more in extreme winter recovery funding to help offset the toll northeast storms have had on our local roads. Is this an emergency? I think our infrastructure is at the state of emergency, uh, frankly. We have not been investing in our roads, bridges, culverts, et cetera, to the extent that I think, and I'm a fiscal conservative, Alan, too, but the extent that I think we have. And as a result, uh, we're seeing an aging infrastructure that uh, I think just uh, earlier in Albany this year, I hit a pothole so hard that it, it popped by uh, my tire. So just as an example, so you see wow. things are breaking down. And frankly, I think the role of government is to invest in infrastructure like that. And I hope that Governor heeds our, our words. I think this is a very valid thing for government to invest in. Have you spoken with Governor Hochul uh, since the last time we spoke? Has she asked for your input on the budget? Alan, I have to say thank you, because I think you uh, raising this issue uh, over the interviews we've done probably resulted in uh, increasing communication between myself and the governor. So I thank you for that. Uh, Minority Leader Orr and myself uh, had an enjoyable breakfast with the governor to talk about the budget maybe two weeks ago. I I can't remember the last time we talked, but it was probably after that. And I thought it was a very productive, open um, conversation. So I appreciate your role in helping facilitate that. Appreciate that very much. Apparently, she does listen. Apparently, they Yeah, I guess so. (laughs) And there is that. If you had one thing you would like the governor to do right now, what would it be? Well, I expressed this to her when we had we had our breakfast. I mean, the two things I hear most from constituents, and frankly, I feel it myself to some extent, are crime and affordability in New York. So I want her to, I hope she does it, use her executive power during this budget process to 
uh, pull back and institute some changes to the bail law. I'd love it if she did to raise the age also. And also, I think she's got to push back, you know, on some of the spending that's being proposed by the Democrats. But certainly she should push back on the four billion dollars of tax increases that the assembly uh, majority is pushing. I think the Senate's pushing some tax increases, too. So hopefully uh, she pushes on that because New York assembly can't afford to pay more taxes. What do you think the real possibility of that kind of conservative approach might be? Well, I, I think, again, it's really in her court so she can push back. She has the power during this process to do it. So it's a question of how much political capital she wants to expend uh, to get some of these things done. Is she going to be able to, you know, institute? I know she believes it. Would she institute, you know, some large scale income tax cuts? No, I, I think that's probably unrealistic, unfortunately. But she certainly can push back to stop, say, hey, let's not increase sales tax on streaming services, on home delivery services. Let's not in increase income taxes on, you know, higher uh, wage earners, that type of thing. She does have the ability to push back, and I hope she does. Will Barclay, I guess the question I have for you is this. What do you think our state of conversation between liberals and um, and conservatives in New York is right now? Do you think things have gotten out of hand? Well, I, yes. I, I do think there's a, um, you know, both sides are have retreated into their corner uh, generally, I think that's not good for New York State. I think it's happening in the country. I don't think it's good for the country. I, I would say this, though, so being in government and being the minority, I have high respect for my colleagues across the aisle because I think they truly believe uh, what they're advocating for is something that they want and they think it's good for their constituency. What I try to do is try to find some I want to get things done. I don't want to just be here and throwing bombs, which I do a lot of, but I also want to get things done. And so I want to try to find common ground that uh, we can, you know, agree on. And take bail, for example, even though the changes to the bail reform law haven't gone as far as I'd like, we have gone and reformed that uh, over the last few years. So there is things that we can get done. We can get done in a bipartisan manner. And those are the issues I try to find common ground and hopefully get something done. So let me ask you about specifics in ethics reform. What needs to be done in this state? That's interesting. Ethics, I think the problem that we've had with ethics is we've had one party rule uh, for a long time now. And it's hard to have Democrats police Democrats. It's like it would be hard to have Republicans police Republicans. Where I think the most effective type of watchdog is a bipartisan uh, body that where Republicans have the interest in keeping holding Democrats accountability and Democrats have the interest of keeping Republicans accountable. Unfortunately, I just think that has left us. We've, we've tried different things where the governor – you know, it was between the governor and the legislature instead of Democrat versus Republican. It was more executive branch versus legislative branch. And the governor had the ability to appoint so many people to the – it was Jacob at the time and the legislature. That system just proved it didn't work because the, the governor had the most appointees and the Jacob would never hold the former governor accountable. And so I think when you try to – the only way I see to get true accountability is make it a true bipartisan body. So let me talk to you about public campaign financing. Hasn't the time come? No, I, I you know, it's interesting you raise that because ideologically, I, I am completely against taxpayers paying for politicians' campaigns. Uh, I think if you asked anybody out in the street, they'd say, no way. Um, but they, it was instituted in law. It's supposed to go into effect this year. Uh, however, there's now talk uh, by uh, the majorities that they're going to suspend it. And frankly, Alan, I think some of that may be coming because they see that there could be a true disadvantage for Democrats under a public finance system. So I understand the political realities. It's kind of an irony that ideologically I, I really oppose to public financing, even though it, it could ultimately help uh, – help Republicans in the legislature. Well, let's go on to some practical politics. Let me ask you this. In your mind, when you speak to family and to friends, do you think that Andrew Cuomo will take on Senator Gillibrand? I think he would like to make a comeback. I'm not sure that is what he's seen. Who knows? Uh, I think he could He could certainly put some uh, – Differences between himself and Senator Gillibrand bring those to light. Whether he could, you know, actually make a comeback in a U.S. Senate race, I, I think might be a stretch. And if anything, you know about 
the former governor, he was politically astute. And, you know, he might like this floated, but I think ultimately when he looks at it, he probably think that's not the best way to reintroduce himself uh, back into the political world. Well, you're pretty politically astute, too, that's for sure, Mill Barclay. So my question to you is, what do you see yourself doing next? <laughs> I like what I'm doing now. Alan, oh, come I'm on. Not looking for anything else. I'm not looking for anything. I've done this for a long time, and I... I don't know how much longer I'll continue, but as long as I feel like I'm being effective and as long as my constituents are pleased with the job I'm doing, I'll continue to do this job. I like it. Okay, so following up on that very good question I just asked, if I may compliment myself, (laughs) who does the GOP, the Republicans, have in the wings for governor next time? You? Not me, but there's so many candidates, Alan, I can't even name them all, but uh, one thing I know— Whoever runs will be uh, a great candidate and will be able to bring the issues that are of concern, obviously, to Republicans, but I think to all New Yorkers. But, you know, we just got through with a gubernatorial race last year, so there's a little time between now and then. And who knows, three years is a lifetime in politics who will come forward. I come, I, I come on. You, you know, you're sitting around the table with, <laughs> you know, other people and you're talking about this. Tell us what you tell them. Faso, yeah, for what I tell them? Faso? Faso, sure. Faso, you'd be great. I, it's, I, it's funny. I'll tell you one thing of interest because we do do predictions sometimes when I'm out socially with my colleagues. And it's great to make the predictions a few years in advance because you'll end up seeing how wrong you are ultimately every time you make those predictions. So I've gotten wiser over the years not to make any of those predictions because they're usually wrong. Well, we are out of time, and I hate it because I love talking to you. Our guest has been New York State Republican Assembly Minority Leader William Will Barclay. Thanks so much for joining us, Will. We look forward to the next time. Thank you, Alan. Capital Connection is a production of WAMC Northeast Public Radio. For copies, call 1-800-323-9262 or visit us online anytime at wamc.org or just schedule a podcast anywhere you get your podcast. And join us again next week at this same time for another political conversation. Thanks for listening.